um, very happy to welcome Saskia. Um, very grateful to you to, um, to you for coming this afternoon. And I'm going to hand over a collection of Greek ritual norms. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks all for for coming um, today. Uh, I would like to present to you a project that's currently being developed at the University of Liège called A Collection of Greek Ritual Norms. Uh, our project is financed by the Belgian Fonds National de la Recherche Scientifique. And I'm working on this project with uh, Vincian Pirin del Forge and with uh, Jan Mathieu Carbon, who is the other postdoc in the project, and also with some further collaborators. I will start with a very brief summary of the project. Uh, it is an online collection and database of as yet 250 texts from the corpus of inscriptions that are usually referred to as sacred laws or lege sacrae. As you can already observe from the title, we prefer to call these texts ritual norms, but I will uh, return to that. And to give you an example for those who don't immediately have a mental image of this material, um, let's take the following brief regulation from Tasos. Uh, to Athena Patroia, a sacrifice of perfect animals is performed every other year, and women also get a piece of the meat. This is a type of text that we are dealing with. So our 250 texts range from the oldest inscriptions we have from the 7th century BC to more or less the 1st century BC. They come from all parts of the Greek world, but we have got a thematic focus on sacrifice and purification. Of these texts we present a description of the monument, a good uh, current edition, uh, an English and a French translation, and then a bibliography and a commentary. In addition, we have created a database, database that is searchable for various characteristics, and all the inscriptions have been encoded and lemmatized using the current uh, XML EpiDoc standard. Well, my presentation today will consist of three parts. First, I will explain to you something about the background of the project. Then I will present the content of the website and um, finally, I will move to a case study showing you one of the things you could actually investigate through our database. And in this presentation, I would like to present some of the problems that are raised by the notion of sacred laws and also show that the problem is indeed larger than simply that of a title or giving a label. And um, uh, of course, I would like to, uh, to show you how our project aims to be a contribution in the scholarship on these problematics. Um, excuse me, sir, I've got a hand handout for you. So, to start with the background, uh, the genre of Lex Sacra in the Greek world was born at the turn of the 19th century when uh, Hans von Prot edited the earliest collection of. Um, what he considered inscribed sacred laws, his Leges Graecorum Sacrae et Titulis Collectae. He completed the first volume on Greek sacrificial calendars, and after his untimely death, his colleague Ludwig Zien in 1906 continued the work with a second volume on Leges Graeciae et Insularum, which was more of a general collection of inscriptions pertaining to Greek religion with an emphasis on geography rather than a theorization of what these lege sacrae actually were. And a further volume Asia Minor was planned, but it never appeared. Then, half a century later, um, the evolution of the corpus continued in a fairly haphazard manner with the work of Franciszek Sokolowski. He published this long-awaited volume on Asia Minor that Zien had envisioned. Uh, this appeared as the Loi Sacrée d'Asia Mineure in 1955, and then he revised von Pot and Zien's work in two volumes, first as a Loi Sacrée Supplement in 1962, and then with a larger Loi Sacrée de Cité Grecque in 1969. So by this time, the genre of the sacred law was firmly established, 
And this is continued, for example, in a very recent uh, publication by Iran Lupu called Greek Sacred Law, a collection of new documents in 2005. So what are sacred laws, you may reasonably ask. Can you give a definition? Well, the short answer is uh, no. Um, with the exception of the original volume by von Plot on the Greek sacrificial calendars, uh, there has been no attempt at a definition, nor could we easily provide one. Now, this question has recently been studied by scholars of Greek epigraphy and religion, um, for example, by Robert Parker in his article, What are Greek Sacred Laws?, which seeks to seriously address these questions for the first time, and also in a volume by uh, Lupu in 2000, 2005, that's also mentioned here. Um, these two contributions were highly insightful, and I will discuss their findings. But first, let's take a very small step back and establish why this is an interesting question in the first place. Well, judging from the name, it seems that these texts have a somehow a sacred character that is pertaining to the divine or to religion, and they are also texts that in one way or another are concerned with the laws um, uh, of a group or a community. And therefore, it would seem that the Leges Sacrae present us with the religious laws of ancient Greek cities, which would be quite fascinating indeed. However, the correct conclusion of these authors, reconsidering the work of von Holtzien and Sokolowski, has been to recognize that Leges Sacrae are not a category in any sense. It has been realized, first of all, just how heterogeneous the material is, and that the words sacred and law are both problematic when so applied. The corpus is constituted, first of all, by all kinds of physical documents. They can be stelae, but also boundary stones and altars, uh, to name but a few. Um, there is also a very wide variety in topic. The corpus contains um, uh, financial accounts, but also sacrificial calendars, uh, priestly contracts and civic decrees, and even oracles, not to mention several other kinds of texts. And especially Lupu inventorized the subject matter that these texts comprise, and he realized that these documents cannot properly be called sacred laws, except as a convenient catchphrase, but it doesn't really mean anything. So the scholarly consensus now seems to be that, um, oh, sorry, uh, moreover, the scholarly consensus is also that there is very little agreement between the modern term sacred law and any existing ancient category of text. And Robert Parker pointed out that also there is no ancient Greek designation that could have been a parallel. The term hieros nomos does occur, but it is exceptional, and it doesn't really represent a coherent body of Greek texts. Um, so leaving that complex matter aside um, for now, another important variation between all of these texts is also their legal character, because actually very few of them can be considered laws. As Robert Parker argued, the material contains on the one hand some inscribed laws or decrees, which are actually no different, except in the subject matter, from other laws and decrees of the community that issued them. But the majority of the relevant texts clearly cannot fall under this heading. They are not laws. Uh, for example, uh, Robert Parker wondered about some rule issued here by the priest of Apollo Eritasios. Uh, the priest of Apollo Eritasios announces and forbids, etc. That's how the, the, the inscription starts. We have no name of this priest, no patronym, no date. So who was this person and what was the... His, the, 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 the power of this law. And Robert Parker uh, wondered, does this have any more force than the no parking sign fastened by an individual to his own garage door? Well, 
my neighbor in Liège, Belgium, actually has such a sign <laughs> on his uh, garage. Um, and considering that hardly any one Wallonian person speaks English, I often wonder whether this has any force at all. <laughs> um, but leaving that aside... Why um, authority does he do that? <laughs> yeah, that's precisely the question. Um, Robert Parker argued that, that this text would fall under a broad category of text he called exegetical material. So these are inscriptions that record religious traditions, codifying them for the first time, or recording changes to the traditional ways of doing things. Uh, but these texts are not decrees, properly speaking, but they are still placed to some degree under the authority of the city or its subgroups somehow. So, to sum up, as these authors showed, the name sacred laws is misleading and doesn't suit the diversity of the epigraphical material that is usually included under that rubric. Moreover, it's clear that we should spend some more time on studying the variation that is offered by these texts. But this is what we intend to do in our collection. We prefer to refer to these texts as ritual norms. Um, by the way, Robert Parker and Lupu did not provide any alternative uh, designation uh, than sacred laws, even though they were not happy with this title either. Um, so we uh, want to call them ritual norms because actually all of the inscriptions we have chosen um, in fact have a normative character somehow, whether they codify the foundation or the reorganization of a cult, and whether they regulated an exceptional or perhaps a more standard practice. How the norm can encompass the whole stratigraphy of these texts from unrecorded traditions to inscribed enactments, from nomima, customs, to nomoi, laws, and psephismata, decrees. And the word, the word ritual perhaps more problematic, but in this context we think it's still more informative than the word sacred. Uh, moreover, to be able to delineate a corpus of text that forms in some sense a meaningful, meaningful whole, our collection of Greek ritual norms will, as I mentioned, for now only include inscriptions that offer detailed norms about sacrifice and purification. Because we consider these two uh, topics to be at the heart of ritual practice. So now I would like to present the content uh, of the website. Um, we are currently developing the website and it will have uh, two functionalities. Uh, first, it will contain 250 individual inscriptions which one may study. And second, it will be possible to use our uh, database and browse and search the collection in various ways. And this will be the welcome page of our website. So, um, as I mentioned, um, the collection uh, is ranging from the 7th to the 1st century BC. And it has this thematic focus on sacrifice and purification. So concerning sacrifice, we focus on inscriptions about the offering and consecration of animals and or vegetable substances. But of course, this is still a very large a group of texts. Uh, and so we have included only those inscriptions that actually include some specific details, stating, for example, the animal or the vegetal that you need to uh, offer and sometimes the date or perhaps a restriction against a particular type of uh, animal or a particular type of sacrifice. In the case of rituals of purity and purification, we have again included inscriptions with a minimum degree of specific ritual information. For example, the number of days one has to uh, wait before entering the summary or the way in which purification has to be uh, done. Um, Uh, so, uh, ritual practice and performance with respect to these two core issues forms the main subject matters of the inscriptions. Um, and, of course, the sacrificial and the purificatory norms often intersect. So, 
uh, the inscriptions are often about both of them. So now let's take a look at the individual files. Um, the um, file of an individual inscription will look more or less like this. So for each inscription we provide information about uh, the date, about the provenance or where it was found, uh, what the stone looks like, uh, the layout of the document. So this is just basic information. And uh, then we provide um, an edition and our computer guys are still busy with that. This is why the Greek looks a bit, uh, we, well, not uh, perfect, let's say that, but th they are working on that. Um, and then we provide two translations in English and French for, because we also, of course, are aimed at the Francophone world, it being a project in uh, Why have you changed typefaces? Um, Actually, we're not supposed to change typefaces, but this is really the website in, in development, so um, in, in the end, it, it's, it will look a bit more beautiful, but uh, I just wanted to present you something, to give you some idea already, but by the time it will actually go online, it will look more consistent and a bit better, so don't worry about that. Um, and then also we give a concise commentary that's aimed both at scholars coming to this material for the first time, but also at a more advanced uh, uh, scholars. So we try to, um, to serve both of them. Um, so the goal is to give a first very good introduction to contextualize the stone, to identify and discuss the main textual issues and then to, to point out the main relevant bibliography and to help the reader in, in that way. Um, our website is also a, a database. And as I mentioned, we have two uh, functionalities, which are browse uh, and search. Um, so on this slide, you will see our browse application. The default is to browse all, and then you simply get a list of uh, our CGRN1 to CGRN2 and 50, and clicking them uh, opens a file of an individual inscription, as I just uh, showed. Um, you can also browse by date, and then only select text from a particular century. Uh, you can select browse by location, and select a particular region. Um, and the other three types of browse, they are not uh, done yet, uh, but uh, in browse by type of text, uh, the user will be able to choose, for example, all sacrificial ca calendars, to say but something. Uh, but we are still developing this. And then we have browse by Greek word and browse by theme. And these two options tie in with our main uh, objectives. And this would be, uh, one of the main objectives to understand the vocabulary of these ritual norms as well as the semantic entities that make up this corpus. So we have lemmatized all Greek content words and in this way hope to develop an insight into the words and clusters of cognates that are more and less prototypical in these texts. So in this, power, uh, this slide you can see the um, not how the browse by theme looks but what it consists of. So we have tagged many different items in the corpus using the tag name type equals and then something and um, occasionally there's also a key. For example, we have tagged <coughs> all instances of gods in the corpus as name type is deity and then with a key for the name of the god. So name type is deity, key is uh, Apollo. Uh, we have done the same for epithets uh, we have tagged all words and phrases that denote the act of sacrifice, so the theme is sacrifice, and all instances of sacrificial animals with a key for the type of animal. And there are also themes concerning their gender and age, gender and the age of the animal. We have also tagged instances of groups such as themes or families or the polis, uh, indicating those people on behalf of whom the sacrifices carried uh, out, and also all instances of the cult 
personnel which performs the sacrifice. More generally, we have tagged structures such as temples or altars, um, localities such as an agora or an acropolis, and authority statements such as the words nomos, uh, law. And I will come back to that. And there are also uh, some other themes. Uh, finally, there is the uh, search functionality of our website, um, it, which is still under development, but you can see a draft here. It will be possible to do uh, advanced searches. Um, so you can search for any term in the translations or commentaries in the first field with uh, Latin characters. So you can type a modern author and you, then you get all instances in our commentaries with references to this author, but you can also search for strings of Greek characters uh, or for exact lemmas, and then you can combine this with the search of a theme, or you can combine uh, searching uh, two themes or two uh, lemmas, for example. Uh, and you can also filter those results, and then you will get only uh, one particular date range or one particular location or one particular text so we hope that this will be helpful uh, for different contexts, prose contexts, but it applies also here. Uh, Palaios refers to a past that is completed, that is dissociated from the present. We can see this, for example, in handout number 12, which is part of a letter by Marcus Aurelius. He describes that he has tried to lead the city back to a palaion ethos, an old custom, but he failed. And then he had to admit that this rule needed to be relaxed. It, 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 in fact, this custom no longer applies. That's why he refers to it as a palaion ethos. And the phrase katatus palaius nomus, or something like that, is not found in um, if you uh, search it in the Packard Humanities Institute inscription database in religious normative text, uh, except where it has been restored, and in my view it has been uh, wrongly restored, um, especially because uh, palai, palai, it's uh, five letters, archai, um, it's the same amount of letters. So wherever it has been restored, uh, palaius nomus, they could have restored archaius nomus. And I think that would have been the um, appropriate restoration. Um, one exception, uh, it's not on the handout, it's a Greek parchment from the Persian, from Persian Kurdistan in the Parthian period. Um, and as Alice Mintz has showed with respect to this text, this text contains several very odd syntactical uh, things and the composer of the prose may or may not have been a native speaker. In any case, in my view, we can see this case as the exception that confirms the rule. Uh, moving away now from the archaios palaios distinction, another current way of referring to tradition um, with the aim of um, giving authority to ritual customs is exemplified in handout number 13, uh, which is a famous text from Ialisos on Rhodes. The purpose of this decree is to ensure that the sanctuary, sanctuary of Electrona <coughs> remains pure, agetai, and thus in a good relationship for a good state for relating to the divine world, according to the ancestral traditions, katata patria. And for this reason, particular animals and objects are not allowed in the sanctuary. Now, it will be useful for our discussion to examine this text in a little bit more detail. First of all, the use of ta patria, again, seems an attempt to rhetorically strengthen the law. We know from the historical context that the cult of Electrona had been in decline, or perhaps it had been completely forgotten in the previous period. And this decree marks a decision to give the, the cult new life, to reinstate the old cult, 
And as uh, Rostad argued, the sanctuary had become disused and was in danger of becoming a pasture. So precisely in this context, the authorities may have wanted to draw up a law against the presence of animals on the premises of the sanctuary to make a very clear statement that this space is not a pasture. And then to frame that law as traditional and besides as part of the covenant with the gods, Ur Hosrion. But we should acknowledge the extremely uh, complicated way that this text has of explaining its sources of authority and the actual role of tradition. In fact, this text shows us how the vocabulary of, vocabulary of authority is really far from evident. The text is a decree which codifies a law, a nomos, nomos line 90 onwards, concerning, concerning the purity of the sanctuary, and that law is inscribed immediately below this decree and as enacted properly has the same sort of value and force that one might expect from other codified Rodian text uh, laws. However, the preliminary decree does not necessarily use the word nomos exclu exclusively in the sense of law. And I quote the translation of lines 3 to 13. In order that the sanctuary of Alatrona remain pure, Aragetai, according to the ancestral customs, Katata Patria, may the Hierotamiae take care that three stelae are made of Latian marble and that this decree is inscribed on them together with the things which are not Hosion to bring in or to lead inside, according to the nomoi, ecton nomon along with the penalty imposed on anyone who acts against the law, paraton nomon. So the penalties of this newly enacted law are defined with a direct and precise, precise references to, uh, sorry, a direct and precise reference to it, paraton nomon. But the allusion to ancestral customs, patria, concerning purity, renders the translation of the uh, plural expression ecton nomon more problematic. Uh, this phrase could of course be translated as according to the laws, but one might well wonder why in that case the singular ecto nomu was not used instead as a further direct indication of the law which was enacted. It seems unlikely that there were other Rhodian laws concerning the purity of this specific sanctuary. And while there may have been a more general set of laws from which one could draw source material concerning purity, this also um, hasn't been established. Um, so um, the expression ecto nomon might equally well point to a common correspondence between the patria and the previously unrecorded nomoi or customs concerning the, sanctuary, uh, the sanctity of the sanctuary. In fact, the text may well have meant to suggest that the ancestral nomoi, more or less equivalent to the patria, paved the way for a recorded singular law which employed the same designation. It thus seems difficult to contrast the word patria with nomos and its cognates, which can equally signify custom or tradition just as well as law or instruction. A final word concerns handouts 14 and 15. Note that these cases witness, in fact, a quite different use of the notion of what is traditional. In these texts, the use of tradition, the mentioning of tradition, in maybe strategies not of legitimizing or strengthening an argument, but rather, more simply, strategies of defining what is and what's not the focus of the document. Everything that is uh, ta nomizomena in handout number 14, or what is kata uh, per proteron and kata ta iotota in handout number 15, um, may simply be what is a given, what is out of focus, whereas the rules of the document that are spelled out define the more interesting parts. So it's a, so it's, it's a focus mechanism. For example, in handout number 15, concerning the lesser Panathenaia, uh, it's, it's not clear here which element precisely 
of the sacrifice is new. There's a scholarly discussion uh, on that, as summarized by Rosen and Osborne. But the decree does seem intended to communicate an amendment to previous decision. And kata per protron seems to um, define what's the same as previously, what is out of focus. Um, so I think it's also necessary to look at these other references of what is old in more detail to see what is their function and how it relates to what we discussed also. So, yes, concerning the ritual norms, I hope it has become clear that a number of things aren't very well understood. What is the distribution of these authority statements? In what way do they or do they not work together? And what's the effect of this? Uh, therefore, one aim of studying the text would be um, understanding the variation and the way in which these elements are combined, both diachronic, uh, geographically, and among types of texts. And this, I think, is one example of where the CGRN may help us understand uh, our corpus better. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tia. Um, okay, well, the cameras and the webcast are still running, so just bear that in mind. Uh, questions? We have a question. First one there. First of all, well, thank you. That was fascinating and beautifully clear. I'm not a historian of ancient Greek, I'm a historian of Babylonia, and we have not identical, but kind of similar genre of texts which establish cultic practices, sacrifices in temples. So I was very interested in your analysis of where the authority for these things comes from, and there's a lot that's in common. Yeah. It's quite clear that some of the Babylonian texts, when they want to innovate, they create tradition. Right? Yes. So temples are incredibly conservative institutions. And so if you want to bring new practices in, you have to say, well, actually, we're just doing it like it was before. And the, previous, the immediately previous generation have got it wrong, right? And so, and we can see this by actually comparing it with what we know about what really went on in previous generation. But one extreme that goes on is that they actually create ancient <laughs> documents like yours. And say, oh, look, we found this thing that proves, it, the old thing that proves that we're going back to Really? Ancient times. Yes, there are three or four of these. So I wondered oh. whether there's any hint in your corpus of using tradition in this sense to create innovation. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that's really fascinating. Well, we can talk afterwards. Um, um, as far as my understanding goes, we often we know too little to determine like the temporal sequence of these mm. things and how old particular customs actually are mm. and when they are, are codified for what purpose that that's precisely a very difficult question mm. why did they write at some point that uh, Athena Patoya needs this or this animal everyone mm. already knew it so Maybe sometimes it, it could have been this purpose, but... Well, yeah, or when tradition is under threat, yeah. But uh, thank you very much, that's yeah. really interesting. And I'm sure your corpus will also help you trace lineages of inscription. So I think it's quite difficult at the moment to see where texts are borrowing from each other. Yes, yes. Um, we do have a few cases of that, where one inscription clearly refers to another inscription or to, to the same kind of ritual norms, and you, you can indeed mm -hmm. trace. Uh, and one of the things we like to do in our corpus is to, to, to have as many cross-references as possible. So uh, I think the electronic format really helps you to yeah. Just to link back and, and forth. So we, we try to do that as much as as possible, in, indeed. Yeah. Just uh, one point, perhaps to embellish the project that you've got. Uh, you mentioned provenance, and perhaps it'd be nice to have maybe a photograph of the description, and possibly on the website, and also 
or maybe a plan showing where it is in relation to the temple or wherever it's found, that would give you more visual sight to the people who are accessing the website than just words. Uh, yes, um, we thought about that because I, some of the other uh, comparable projects indeed do this. And the, the photographs are quite, it, it is nice to see a photograph. Um, for now, we have not done this, first of all, because we are not ourselves archaeologists. So uh, if you are going to show a plan and say it was found there, sometimes when, I, yeah, of course, we could, we could do that. Uh, but we have not been to the actual stones to see them for ourselves. We have used current good edition, so we have not made our own photographs. So it, I think it would be a, um, for copyright reasons. I, I think for that reason we thought it was a little bit complicated to do it right now. So just raising the point again on that is, first mm -hmm. of all, a lot of people access your, access your website will be archaeologists, so they'll be interested in looking at it. That's so true. The yes. other thing is a lot of, from my experience of seeing various inscriptions, we often have pictorial objects like a, a, a flail or a, a, a Ilex or, or a jar in Uraeus or something that shows the ritual processes which add a bit of more detail to what, what they're trying to say. It's not just words or something like that. And that would help. And also sometimes colour-coded plans, so you can say that's Roman, that's Greek, Hellenistic, whatever. It just make the picture look It's true. As possible. At so the moment we have um, one inscription that's the nicest is where the stone must have contained like a, how do you, like a mold for the, the type of cake, the shape of the cake that you had to sacrifice. And then yeah. the inscription refers to, as, uh, as is uh, indicated by the mold, uh, you have to sacrifice a cake of this and this uh, shape. So then it would be very nice to, to see the stone. But thank you very much, especially showing where the inscription was found precisely because now we write it in words but you're right it could help to to, to include a plan of that uh, the computer guys will not be so happy because it's That's already right. a bit complex for them i put a spanner in the works it just uh, i've seen websites like that and they're very informative and it's true just add a little bit more enrichment it's true it. that people you know they get bored easily so they like to be stimulated with different types of of information yeah thanks yep um, thank you, it's really interesting. Um, I was wondering a bit about um, the terminology and ritual norm, and you're saying that um, you're obviously focusing on sacrifice and purification, so yeah. it's very much um, cultural practices at the moment. And I was wondering whether um, you would plan to kind of expand it and um, include, obviously, I know most of the um, documents you have, have about Greek religion, especially. Regulations are Celtic, but um, when you are looking to expand it a bit further to kind of look beyond that and look at um, maybe include inscriptions like um, the honouring of the god, for example. Um, I know there aren't many of them, but I was thinking of um, in Athens there's a decree honouring, um, crowning Ampliareos, and I know it's an unusual inscription, but things like that, so where you Maybe they say more about human divine relationships, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or do you always that not something you would? Um, well, we would like to expand, but it really depend, depends on further funding. Okay. And I think perhaps we would start by expanding a bit more, by, by, by doing a bit more of the same, mm -hmm. so that we would reach more of a completeness on these thematics. And then. Uh, but uh, if, frankly, there, if, if there's no funding, it's quite time consuming. So then I, I don't know um, where we could expand on a larger scale. It would be very nice, of course. But um, I guess in, in terminology, ritual form, you're kind of also limiting yourself. I mean, it's, it's difficult because I know it's safe because it's not particularly useful. Yes. Well, we try to limit ourselves. Mm -hmm. That was, <laughs> for now, that was the goal to, to, to have some meaningful corpus. But uh, yeah, it's actually nice if you say it's limiting us um, for for the moment. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. I wonder again. This is a suggestion for adding to it. Whether it would be worth, in some cases 
uh, putting in literary texts, which seem to be uh, uh, apposite. I mean, the, the one I'm thinking of is in the, in the Ion of Euripides, where the priestess, is, her duty is to get up every morning and, and sweep away, which is another form of purification, to keep the birds at bay. And then there are one or two things like that which would help to describe what actually occurs. I know fictional texts are, are different from epigraphic texts, um, and they may shed light on them. Yes, well, of course that would be useful, um, but for now we also don't want to confuse the reader, because, for example, the passage you refer to in the prologue of the Ion, I think that's so very... Um, a bit of an ironical passage where Ion is completely obsessed with purity and with sweeping away and, and the birds that are defiling the century, it's a bit ridiculous. Uh, but it's, of course it's very interesting, but because it's, it's, it's a different genre, it would, be, it would necessitate a commentaries of themselves about, but you're right, it's, it's, it's the literary uh, complementary, complementary evidence is very important, and as far as we could, we have already in, input uh, put cross references, uh, but we don't present now the literary evidence in its own right. You're right; it could it could make a good balance and to to show us a bit more because often literary texts are a bit more informative, or give a bit more context. But I would say we would have to do that with with caution also, but. Yeah. I actually have a related question, ah. um, and it's not my field at all. Um, <laughs> but I mean, this extremely compelling model that you presented of how norms can be defined through text of this sort, I mean, do you think that might change over time with the kind of adoption and evolution of legal codification, you know, these texts which actually set out explicitly set out, you know, legal, acceptable behavior. Is there any relationship between the two kinds of traditions, do you think? Um, well, that's obviously, obviously a very interesting question. Uh, as law, as a more formalized notion, develops how that would influence this whole, this whole business. Um, for now, I can say that we have a very large diachronic range of inscriptions which keep on doing exactly the same thing. And so, um, but I'm not sure in terms of quantity or in terms of trends, how the one would um, differ from the other. And yes, that's, that's obviously one thing that, that we should keep in mind, and which I did not mention in this, because I did not take a very diachronic look, but that's definitely um, important. But somehow we keep on seeing the same kind of text. And they, mm. they keep on doing it like this, even though they're in, like, in the archaic period. It's different. The situation is different from the Hellenistic period, but still the texts are exactly the same, or more or less the same. So. It seems to me that the, I'm, I'm, I think your, your analysis of terrific, and I can imagine the implied, of course, I didn't know anything about Babylonia, but I can imagine all kinds of other places in which a similar kind of thing could be done. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, I think you have answered it. it I, I thought 250 wasn't enough. I wanted to expand magic and call it a question about money. It seems to me that the, uh, virtually all of these things are. You use the word authority. I, I say power because the, e each time it does it, it, it's not just we have the authority to do it, but we know some of the consequent are saying that we have the, this, this or that should happen. Except number 12, it seems to be different. Uh, this is the, the chap saying what I did and what protected Athens. That seems to be quite a different sort of thing. Uh, yes, it, it's a letter. Mm. So it's a very, it's, you're right, it's a different kind of uh, yes. so text. What did you put that in? Actually, I just put it in to, sh to, See, to, it was a to, to, to make my <laughs> semantic point about palaios, that it refers to something that's no longer relevant or no longer actual. Um, 
I did not have an example of a ritual norm with Palaios to make the same point because yeah, I just didn't find one. Um, you're right, it's a completely different type of, of text. Yes. And would, would it really was a letter, so it was it to a known person, to another known person? I think to the Athenians. Mar Marcus Aurelius, yes, yes. he wrote to the Athenians. Uh, so you would expect it to be a wide audience too? Yes, okay. yes. And did you say that 250 inscriptions, it wasn't enough? It wasn't enough. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm obsessed with the idea of big data, you see. <laughs> <laughs> we all are these days. <laughs> well, we also think it's not enough. Yes, good. Oh, well, okay. um, it's quite a lot of work to encode the inscriptions, to write the commentaries, so it would be great to have more because then you have a better statistical basis yes. to say ac actual things. So if we had a double, that would be already so much better. Um, so uh, we are applying for further funding. So yes, that would be definitely great to, to expand on our current collection. What is the possible universe? I mean, how many are there? It's a very difficult question. I asked uh, my boss, Vincian, the same thing yes. uh, a few weeks ago, and she, what she said, she said if we have 500, then we do have the most interesting ones. Oh. Uh, on, on, on this thematics. Yes. Of course, there's a thousand many, many, many inscriptions, but for inscriptions that have this thematics and that give some details, so that are actually quite interesting, she said to me, if we have 500, it would be already really quite a good proportion, like a... And it's a long time span, so it's not many really each year, so to speak. I'm sorry? No, 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 it's a lot, yes, yes. But we cut it out there, because first we had more, but... Well, your handout's so fascinating, and the website will be too, so it's a, therefore a temptation for, to, to fasten into particular uh, text that you've given us. Yes. And, and I, I noticed that in, in text number nine, it says that the slaughter of the bovine has to be in front of the statues. I think it's like this bit here. Um, it's on the top of the page. And that, that's interesting. But one of the others, number four, mentions statues as one of the things to be sacrificed. And it looks, it looks very odd here because there's yes. a list of foodstuffs and things that are yes. thrown about. And, and the word statues comes in the middle of that. Yes. And, and looks very odd. One it, it's maybe is a different word or maybe it means little statuettes or, or yes. something else. Yes, we write something about that in the, the commentary, or uh, I wrote, because it's indeed a bit bizarre. And, um, but uh, the best guess in the literature is now that they are indeed small statuettes or of some kind. And that this word is, I think, used in one other inscription in the same sense. Um, it's Agalman, right? It's Agalman. Yes. Agalman is usually used for Agalma, something, but, yeah, that, for something that big. That you wonder at, you know, it's not, yes. it's not a, a, a tiny big statue thing. of the, of the yes. gods, yes. But um, once the collection will come online, you, mm, uh, if you are interested, you could read the commentary because yes. uh, I, I, there was one other inscription where the word Agalma is probably used for the same small statuette, but yeah, it's. it's uh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure, but I also thought it must be the small statuette. Okay. Um, also in the order of things, because it's an individual <coughs> having a little bit of incense here, and so. Any other questions? Excellent. Well, I, I have several, but I think I'm going to keep those for the uh, informal parts, so we'll thank Saskia. <laughs> <laughs>